Welcome to the Rubis SSN Subbrief. I'm Aaron, your host. Let's talk about our sources. Uh, a lot of pictures came from Saturn X1 again. He supported the project here. And uh, we also got some artwork from 800tons.com. So I'm going to send a big thank you to both these gentlemen, Saturn X and uh, the gentleman that runs 800tons.com. And uh, ask you that are watching this to maybe support the artists that support me. Uh, they're both very generous with their work. They offer the pictures and artwork that you see here in these briefs. So please consider visiting uh, Saturn X1 on Twitter, giving them a follow. And then 800tons.com sells his artwork. Uh, I'm going to support him by buying a piece of artwork this summer. And I would ask that you guys just check it out. And uh, you know, if you see something you like, support him by uh, buying one of his pieces of art. He's really, really talented. Some of the websites that I use for these uh, for this brief was globalsecurity.org, Naval Technology, Naval News, Military Today, NavWeps, Naval Group, that's the shipyard that or the company that's building the submarine today, and NavalRecognition.com. These are fact-based websites. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the Rubis that maybe you don't see here in the brief, definitely check out these uh, websites. They have lots of information about the sub today. All right, let's begin in 1974. France wants to build a nuclear submarine and uh, what they want, end up doing is taking the Agosta class, which is a conventionally powered diesel boat that is operational right now. And they want to convert it into a nuclear powered sub, essentially ripping out the diesel engine and replacing it with, you know, a small nuclear reactor, but essentially keeping the rest of the submarine the same or as much as possible. Uh, that way they don't have to redesign too much stuff. Uh, this design is a little bit less expensive because a lot of the work is already done in terms of uh, piping and whatnot for all the other systems. So the original idea that they had from 1972, two years earlier, to build a whole new submarine, that idea is scrapped. It's too expensive. It was already falling behind. And so that's why we're not even talking about it today. Um, so they went ahead with this idea of taking a conventionally powered submarine that's already proven. It's in the fleet operating right now. And uh, they're going to make it a nuclear powered version and call it the Rubis. So by keeping the same electric motor in the engine room, that really saves them a lot of uh, retooling and uh, maintenance that would normally go on with building a nuclear submarine. Because there's a lot more to a nuclear submarine's engine room than just the reactor. The reduction gears and the prime mover, the, the main engine, if you will, that pushes you know, the screw to help propel the thing through the water, that requires a lot of uh, maintenance. Well, they've, they're have they gonna reuse the same large electric motor to turn the shaft. So they already have those maintenance plans down. And more importantly, they've built them in the past. So the building another one is not as much of a challenge as it is building another or a new prime mover, main engine nuclear powered. It's gonna be the new, smallest nuclear submarine ever built. And uh, it only produces 800 megawatts. So the reactor vessel itself is very small. And because of its design and its size, it will have to be refueled every seven years. Contrast that with submarines that were being built in the uh, early 80s. They would be refueled every 12 to 15 years normally. So this is almost twice as often. Uh, and it probably has to do with the size of it. Uh, they're burning through that fuel pretty quick. Okay, Design Bureau uh, is DCAN, D-C-A-N. They've gone through a number of name changes over the years. So I, at the time of them building the submarine, they're DCAN. But in today's world, they're Naval Group, building submarines for people like the Australians. So they went through, um, they became DCN in 1991, uh, DCNS in 2007, and Naval Group in 2017. They are headquartered out of Paris, France. And they have a website called naval-group.com that uh, if you want to learn more about the company, you can just go there. They have a great website. All right, all these submarines, all the Rubis class are going to be built in Sherberg Naval Shipyard. This is a privately owned shipyard up there in Sherberg. They primarily produce civilian vessels, everything from tugboats to multi-million dollar yachts for billionaires. They kind of do it all. And they're really known for their yacht business. They do an outstanding job of that. But they also build some military vessels for France, and they're building the Rubis class for us here today. The history of the shipyard goes back uh, ages. They've built over 700 units in their lifetime for over 37 nations around the world. And so they're very successful. In 2015, they had an upgraded uh, a fund, and they upgraded and expanded the facilities Right here, where my cursor is, you can see how they added this little section here. And this is like an assembly building for things like yachts and ships. And here you can see an artist render of the buildings themselves. 
So they are continuing to improve and upgrade the shipyard as the years go by. All right, Canada thought briefly about buying the Rubus class for itself in uh, 1987, a few years after the Rubus classes were being built, uh, a white paper comes out recommending that Canada buys 12 of these Rubus classes, as long as they meet the Canadian statement of requirements. Uh, turns out the Rubus failed just about all of them because the Rubus is a noisy submarine. It has got the, 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 the Achilles heel of all submarines being noise and it fails that test tremendously. It is just a very noisy, poorly sound silenced nuclear reactor, which is kind of shocking because the Agosta conventional submarine that it's based on is a relatively quiet diesel boat. It's pretty capable, but whenever they put the reactor on it, they didn't sound silence those components properly. So even at slow speed, and this is a slow submarine, uh, she's still very noisy, has a lot of reactor noise. Her top speed is somewhere in the vicinity of 25 knots, um, which is pretty slow for a nuclear submarine. Most nuclear submarines can at least push themselves up to 30 knots, if not even higher than that. And the big thing for Canada was it could not shoot a Mark 48 torpedo because it was so small. The torpedo tubes are too short to even house the Mark 48. The, the nose of the Mark 48 would be sticking out the front a little bit if they tried to load one into the tubes and shut the door in the torpedo room. It just simply didn't fit. So it, that really killed it because NATO, the United States and uh, the UK with their spearfish, we share our weapon technology with our NATO allies. And there's a lot of countries in NATO and around the world even, outside of NATO, that shoot the Mark 48. Well, Canada wants to be one of those two and simply can't do it with the Rubus. Uh, the Rubus would have cost them only $350 million per submarine, a relative bargain. This is, you know, this is an entry level, you know, submarine here. If you're trying to get into the submarine game, their other option was to buy the much more capable, faster, quieter Trafalgar class nuclear submarine for $50 million a pop. And, uh, they should have gone that route, but they were afraid that the transfer of nuclear technology that had to be approved of by the United States was not going to get approved. And so they didn't want to pursue that route without confidence of them being able to make the deal in the end. They didn't want to waste their time, essentially. So in 1988, the next year, uh, DCN comes back to Canada and says, hey, we've made some revisions to the Rubus. It's still small. It doesn't fit the Mark 48. Uh, we can't really sound isolate, but we've reinforced the sail and topside, and now you can use it up in the Arctic uh, Ocean and do ice picking because that was one of the requirements for Canada was that it had to be multi-ocean capability, linking the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean over the top of Canada, which is you know full of ice and it needed under ice capability. So even with that improvement, Canada uh, ended up turning them down and they didn't get the Trafalgar class either. So Canada uh, ended up losing out by not getting either one of the submarines that they wanted. But France went ahead and built uh, the Rubus class. Uh, initially, the first hall was called Provence. Yeah. But, and, and Provence is named after a part of uh, Southern France, but they renamed the submarine after it was launched, but before it was commissioned in that little time period there to Rubus. And they're going to name all of these submarines, except one after precious stones. So this is uh, obviously named after the Ruby. Uh, after she's launched, she sails for over a thousand submerged hours. That's a lot of testing. So she had a lot of problems. Uh, she was slow. She was noisy. Uh, and they were just trying to figure, you know, what could they do to make the submarine better before commissioning? Finally, they just commissioned it in 1983 uh, with doing what they could, but it still had those problems. Uh, it inherited the torpedo and sonar systems from the Agosta class. So those are the older uh, torpedo and sonar systems from the 1960s. So now she's got older equipment, equipment that's already going obsolete in a slow, noisy nuclear submarine. So already uh, this class has a lot of strikes against it without too many, you know, positive things to say about it. Uh, each submarine though, will have two crews. This is very similar to how the Americans operate our ballistic missile submarines. We have a blue crew and a gold crew. Well, they do the same thing there where there's a deployment period, which can last anything from two to three months. And then there's a maintenance period, which is typically four weeks. Um, and so both crews during the maintenance period will work together on the, on the submarine, at least for part of that maintenance period it may not be the whole thing. 
Uh, and then one of the crews will take it to sea while the other crew goes on to R and R and training ashore and does other things. And, uh, the submarine will eventually come back two or three months later and they'll do a maintenance period again together with both crews for a little while. And then the submarine will go back to sea for another two or three months, but with the other crew the second time and the crew that just came back, they'll go and do a few months of training ashore. It's a very good rotation for quality of life of a sailor who wants to serve on board a nuclear submarine, but not be underway all the time. And it works for them. So in 1985, uh, she evacuated three French agents from New Zealand after they sabotaged a Greenpeace vessel in port. Um, the way this happened was, is that three agents arrived in New Zealand. It's not clear how they arrived. Uh, and they had uh, swim gear and they had some magnetic mines with timers on them. And they swam into the harbor. They placed two charges on the Rainbow Warrior, the little ship there you see in the picture there. And then they swam away towards the submarine. Uh, the timers went off, uh, individually. So one went off first, uh, kind of notifying everybody on board that, you know, there was a, an attack, you know, to, to get off and nobody was hurt. Everybody got off the submarine or, or off the rainbow warrior ship because it was in port after the first explosion damaged the ship. So, uh, there's a photographer on board and he wants to document the attack because this is going to be a big, they want to turn it into public relations, uh, information but he left his camera back on board the ship and he goes back on board to get it. And that's when the second explosion goes off. The second explosion is much bigger. It's designed to sink the ship, not just warn everybody about it. And unfortunately it does kill the photographer and there's a uh, one death in this uh, attack, but they specifically uh, made the attack so that nobody would get hurt. The first explosion did damage the vessel, but was more of a warning of you better get off this thing. And then a few minutes later, the big detonation happens and sinks, uh, the Rainbow Warrior in port. Uh, Rubis goes on to serve in many more conflicts. In 1991, the Gulf War, she was in the Arabian uh, Sea. Uh, in 1993, she pulls into dry dock for her amethyst refit. We'll talk about this at the end of the brief, but essentially the amethyst refit is an updating of the sonar system, fire control system, and they address a lot of the sound short problems with the, with the engine room. In 1995, she has a collision with Shell Oil tanker Lyra off the coast of Toulon. That's where all of these are based out of is Toulon, France. So she's either pulling in, pulling out, or operating near Toulon when she hits an oil tanker, causing 40 million francs of damage. And it's a big problem because it involves a submarine. So, of course, there's a lot of negative publicity with that. Nobody was hurt. That's the most important thing. In 1999, she's part of Operation Trident, which is the Yugoslavian Wars. That happened during that time. She is responsible for interdicting uh, ships passing through the KOTOR Straits. This essentially blockades uh, the Yugoslavian Navy from uh, doing from from going to sea. And Yugoslavia was you know broke up into a couple different countries, but it essentially kept them from fighting each other at at, at sea by blocking these KOTOR Straits. In 2002, she's part of Operation Hercules, which is the invasion of Afghanistan. So she's off in the uh, Arabian Sea at that point, uh, supporting American naval operations as they deploy troops into Afghanistan. In 2007, she's uh, submerged in shallow water right off the coast of France again, but uh, took too much of an angle on the down dive and hit the bottom, and that damaged the sonar bow, which is a, a big pain to fix. So, uh, and, it, and they were lucky that it wasn't catastrophic because if you uh, damage the sonar dome enough, you can uh, push those hydrophones into the pressure tank and uh, that would flood the forward compartment. So uh, there's lots of watertight doors to keep that from happening, but they're lucky that that didn't happen. They just damaged the, the bow itself in 2007. Uh, she was repaired and went back to sea after that. Uh, but she was just recently decommissioned here in 2020. That's Rubus, hull one. Okay, Rubus, by the numbers, uh, she's displacing uh, 3,600 tons. She has a length of 241 feet, a beam a wide of 25 feet. So very short, kind of skinny. You know, I call it a boutique submarine because it is just a teeny tiny thing. Uh, she does 18 knots on the surface, 25 submerged. Uh, her K48 pressurized water reactor produces 48 megawatts, which I believe that's where they got the K48 from. And it can turn that electric motor on the main shaft at 64,000 horsepower. She has two turbo alternators converting electricity and a one 9,400 horsepower electric motor 
uh, one shaft, five blades. Her crew is about 66 people, you know, give or take one or two. She can go to sea for 45 days at a time without pulling in for stores and maintenance. Uh, she has two or correction four, 53 centimeter torpedo tubes shooting the F 17 torpedoes exoset SM 39 missiles, or she can lay sea mines too. So she's mine capable. She has the uh, Dumex 20 active passive sonar array, and she is towed array capable as well. And that's really important. I mean, as noisy as she is and all the faults that she has, at least with the towed array, she can go out and conduct, uh, you know, long range surveillance. She's too noisy to, to really get close to anybody of any capability. Other submarines, I should point out. Uh, in a sub on sub fight, she would be at a disadvantage. But with her towed array, she can at least see other submarines uh, long before they, 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 they get close to her. All right, let's talk about the F-17 Torpedo Mod 2. Uh, went into service in 1973. So as they're designing and building the Rubus class, uh, this torpedo is just coming out. It can do 40 knots, has a range of about 22,000 yards, 550 pound warhead, and it's a 3,000 pound weapon powered by a silver zinc oxide battery. Now the silver zinc oxide batteries, those aren't rechargeable. So those are used in more shots. Uh, but here in the picture, if you look in the background, you can see some of the torpedoes with a orange body. Uh, that's, that's the uh, other battery that is rechargeable. So the, those are exercise shots that they shoot and then recover to shoot again for training. So if it's orange, it's not a war shot. If it's black or pretty much any other color like green, it's a war shot. And the Exocet uh, missile, very successful anti-ship missile has been used in a couple different conflicts and it's determined its effectiveness. Here you can see the submarine version of it being launched. Now, the way the Exocet submarine uh, version of the Ex Exocet works is different than say the Harpoon uh, and, and, and other missiles. Here you can see the canister in which the missile is inside is ejected out of the water with the rocket booster motor. That's different than say the harpoon. In the case of the harpoon, the, the canister itself stays in the water. It's just, once it gets to the surface, it then ejects the missile. Well, in this case, the whole canister, as you can see, is coming out of the water, getting up to an altitude high enough to then expel the Exocet missile. And then the missile has enough energy at that point just to start its own motor and continue downrange. Uh, Exocet went into service in 1979. Uh, it's an encapsulated launch. It has a range of about 43 miles. Sapphire S602. This is hull two of the Rubus class. Her keel is laid in 1976. She's launched in 79 and commissioned in 1983, where she does a lot of operations in the Mediterranean in the 1980s and the North Atlantic. Uh, the French are very aware of her limitations, so she's not forward deployed uh, as often. Until 1991, she gets the Amethyst upgrades, which does address a lot of the sound silencing problems, making her quieter than she was, and also in, improves the uh, sonar system. She gets the upgraded sonar system, which is a big deal. Uh, so now she's far more capable in an offensive role and surveillance role than, than she was before after the Amethyst upgrade. A lot of times you'll see this class called the Rubus Amethyst class. Uh, because it's that much of an improvement that she, it's like having a new submarine class. In 2001, she sinks a target ship with a torpedo, a live fire shot. Those are pretty rare, um, but she does it in 2001. And most significantly, and this should get everybody's attention, in 2015, uh, despite her disadvantages in terms of speed and uh, noise, uh, she does manage to sink uh, America's one of America's newest carriers, the Theodore Roosevelt in war games in 2015 off the coast of Florida. She sinks her and a number of her escort vessels before being uh, detected and then, you know, simulated sunk herself. Cause that's how this is going to end uh, in time of war is, you know, our carrier will be damaged if not sunk. Uh, the escorts with her will also be damaged and sunk, but any air assets that that fleet has will find the submarine doing the damage and sink the submarine. It's going to be a one for one trading our carrier for a submarine that, that that's how any war is going to go down in the future. Yet we keep building our carriers as if they're in penetrable islands, unsinkable 
you know, the, the U S Navy suffers from the Titanic, you know, syndrome where we think that our carriers are unsinkable and we will quickly find out that they are quite sinkable even by a flawed design like the Rubis class submarine. Casabianca, the only Rubis class that's not named after a precious stone. Casabianca. Hall 3 laid down in 1981, launched in 84, commissioned in 87. Uh, the only Rubis class not named after a stone, like I said. She gets her amethyst upgrades in 1994, and that's really whenever she begins deploying. In 2003, she does a port visit in Severmorsk. That's the home of the Red Banner fleet for Russia up on the Kola Peninsula. And it's just a goodwill visit saying, hey, Cold War's over. We're all friends now, right? Right, comrade? And, you know, they share vodka. And it's actually a really cool visit. Russia welcomes them. You know, obviously Russia invited them to the port to begin with. And it's really good for relations. Calms things down a little bit. In routine uh, deployments to the Med, she's done those for 20 years. Uh, she's still operational, uh, having a good time in the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, mostly the Med. You know, if you go to the Med, you're going to probably run across one of these. And if you're on the NATO side of things, you're going to probably end up doing war games with them because uh, the ones that are still operational, there's four operational as of the time of this recording. Uh, one of them is usually deployed in the Med. Hull 4, the Emerald. This is the S604. She's laid down in 1983, launched in 86, commissioned in 1988. She doesn't do a lot because she's limited in uh, capability with the old sonar system until 1995. Now, after 1995, she's beginning to do more and more deployments, uh, a lot more capable. In 2009, she uh, helps fly or helps find uh, Air France Flight 447. Uh, in the mid Atlantic and an operational in 2021. She's still out there doing things. Uh, I don't know if they ever found that flight recorder. Uh, I've, I've been deployed myself to find flight recorders uh, of missing planes. And in, in, in my career, we were never able to find one because uh, the batteries only last a couple days and uh, you don't know exactly where the flight went down when it goes down over the ocean. So it takes a lot of time to find these planes, but she did that in 2009. Amethyst. S-605, this is the first Rubis class that is actually built with the Amethyst upgrades, and it's the hull that all the Amethyst upgrades are named after. So she, from day one, is going to have the upgraded sonar system. She's commissioned in 1992, by the way, uh, with all these improved systems. And there you can see a picture of the control room, color displays, um, AI algorithmic detection to help notify sonar operators of possible detections. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, machine learning happening where the sonar system gets better over time, which is really cool. Um, in 1999, she's part of Operation Allied Force in the Yugoslavian War, joining the other Rubis that was there helping them out. In 2010, she's deployed with aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle to fight piracy off the coast of Somalia and in the Indian Ocean. She spent a lot of time in the Arabian Sea off the coast of India during that deployment in 2010. Uh, she did his war games with the Indian Navy as well. And that was called Varuna 10, 10 being the year in which it takes place. And she has since then done a lot of operations everywhere from the Indian ocean to, um, to the Atlantic ocean and everywhere in between. And then there's Pearl, Pearl 606. Um, her keel was launched in 1990 and commissioned in 1993 uh, 2010 worked with NATO during, uh, the North Atlantic exercise. And, uh, sadly she was gutted by fire, uh, last year, June 12th of 2020. Uh, this was a very serious fire that happened, uh, while she was in a dry dock period and completely gutted the forward section. Uh, these submarines, because they're so small, only have two sections. They have an engine room and a bow compartment or forward compartment. Well, the entire forward compartment is destroyed essentially by fire, fire that raged for hours and hours on June 12th, uh, wasn't brought under control until late into the night. And, uh, you know, it, some, some firefighters were even injured through heat exhaustion and smoke inhalation. And, uh, it was just a real mess. You know, shipyard periods are very dangerous times for all vessels whether it's a ship or a submarine does not matter. And fire is the most common hazard that we see in shipyards. And uh, one of the best ways to, to combat that honestly is to clean that submarine every single day, because every day you have all this, 
you know, dust and metallic filings from grinding and welding uh, all over the inside of the ship. Um, and those little things collect and uh, dust builds up on that. And that is all eventually Kindle material for a fire. And so the idea, at least in the United States shipyards, is as a crew, we just clean that submarine every single day. And it gets old. It's tough on the crew. But you know what? It keeps a fire from happening. And sadly, that's what happened here. A fire absolutely gutted uh, the forward part of the most recent, most capable <laughs> Rubus class submarine in uh, June. Let's see. In 10 December 2020, she's transported uh, to Sherberg uh, in Conton to... Uh, to be re refitted. Like they're going to try and repair this. They're using the bow section of the Sapphire that had just been decommissioned, uh, to completely replace the bow section of the one that was damaged by the fire. And I got a picture of that here. I'll show you in a second. Let's take a look at the fire damage first. Uh, this is what the inside of the submarine looks like, uh, after the fire. And as you can see, uh, any hope of restoration, uh, would be immensely time consuming and expensive. And this is why they're just going to scrap the bow section here. There at the bottom center, you can see an outside view of how the heat just completely scorched the forward compartment down to its framework, you know, and all that metal may be fatigued from heat. Uh, they would have to do all sorts of testing to make sure that it could still withstand the pressures of deep diving. So instead of taking that risk, spending all that time and money, they go ahead and they take the bow section of the Sapphire that's still up in Sherberg where it was getting ready to be scrapped. And they said, hold on to that cutting torch there, sailor. We're going to use this bow section as the bow of the Pearl. So the Pearl after 2020, and this is still in progress after 2021, is going to be half Sapphire and half Pearl. Uh, and there you see them on the right, joining the two sections together. Um, because in a sense, this is a modular submarine in that it has two compartments that, because it's of the same class, they can fit any one with any other with a little bit of work to uh, make sure everything connects properly. So this is a great idea, and uh, I can't wait to see uh, how it operates after they get this out back into the water. Uh, at the time of this recording, this is still in progress, so uh, we won't know until after she's back to sea trials again, which hopefully will be done by the end of 2021. All right, so we've talked a lot about the amethyst upgrades. So let's talk specifically about what those were. They began in 1989 uh, and were installed all the way through to 1995 at the Toulon Naval Shipyard. They didn't have to go back to the original shipyard that they were built in to get these upgrades. They could do them right there in Toulon. Uh, they get a new spherical sonar array in the bow. And that's kind of a big deal because the shape of your array determines its performance and a spherical array will always be better at a mechanical analog level than a cylinder array. Now with digital beam forming and today's technology, you can still take a cylinder array and make it appear round. But if the array itself is round to begin with, it will already have those nulls that help beam forming become more effective. Okay, it's 1.5 meters longer. They get the new Dukes uh, 5 passive sonar wide aperture linear array along the side, both sides of the hull. Uh, the wide aperture arrays are really, really good in that they can quickly identify and localize contacts by essentially triangulating their range without ever having to move. So the array is so long running down the entire side of the submarine uh, that as sound waves hit one end of the array and then eventually the other end of the array, there's a little bit of a time delay there measured in microseconds, right? But it's enough of a time delay for the computer to say, hey, estimated on how this waveform is coming out into the array, the direction is that way, you know, we'll say 090, and it looks like he's about 5,000 yards away. The computer is going to give an estimate of that upon detection. And that's a level of capability uh, sonar didn't have in say 1980s, but in the 1990s, that became a thing and it's only gotten better since then. So big, big capability on the sonar side of things with the amethyst upgrades. Uh, they also added automatic sonar trackers, low frequency capability because that, that hull array, that, that wide aperture array can do low frequency passive localization between two kilohertz and 15 kilohertz passive detections. Um, 
Again, localization is giving the operator the idea of how far away the source is immediately. Big, big improvement. Uh, service life extension of the hull until the Barracuda class becomes operational. Yeah, this is going to be superseded by the Barracuda eventually. Uh, one Barracuda is already operational now, I believe, and there's more being built. So this is this is kind of the end of the Rubus's life in the 2020s. Uh, and she'll probably all be retired before 2030 is what we expect. Also, during the Amethyst upgrade, it's also a hydrodynamic upgrade. So they make the outside of the hull a little more hydro efficient. And they did a lot of sound silencing improvements in the engine room, trying to knock down that, that noise level. Um, it's better than it was, I'll say that. All right, the F-21 Heavy Torpedo. Uh, this is France's newest heavy torpedo, and they're using the Rubus class to do testing on it. Uh, they've been doing this testing for three years now, south of Toulon on the little torpedo firing range that they have down there. And so not only can the Rubus um, fire the F-21, which is great because it's an awesome weapon, it's, it's, it's top of the line as far as France goes. Uh, so it's going to be a great addition to, to the Rubus. Um, but she's also a good test platform for it. So this new uh, torpedo does 50 knots plus. It's actually a lot faster than that. But the unclassified speed is 50 knots. Uh, uses the aluminum silver oxide batteries, which is an improvement over the zinc silver. Uh, very high energy output. Um, it's fiber optically guided uh, and has a range of uh, in excess of 27 nautical miles. Very, very good torpedo. This is, this is the French spearfish you know it's it's not as good in my opinion as the spearfish but it, it's pretty darn close it'll, it'll sink a ship the big thing here is that it's a heavyweight torpedo versus the relatively lightweight of the uh, f-17 torpedo the f-17 well still has a large warhead this one's even larger all right final thoughts on the rubus man well i'll be honest with you guys um i love submarines in general but this one trips two of the main uh, primary things a submarine needs to be. A submarine needs to be fast. It needs to be quiet. And it's neither one of those two things. This is a slow submarine. Um, it's underpowered big time. They should have put a larger reactor in it, uh, but they didn't. And so she's just slow. She has a top speed of 25 knots. There are conventional diesel boats that are faster than this one. Yeah. The new Soryu out of Japan, faster than this boat. Submerged. Yeah. And quieter because this thing's noisy. This thing's running around, you know, with a, it sounds like a blender in a tea kettle. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty noisy, especially at high speeds, but even at slow speeds, you can hear the pumps and you'll, you'll see this one coming a mile away if you have a good sonar system. So, but with the amethyst upgrades, they, uh, they, they improved a lot of that performance. You know, they made the hull more hydrodynamic to try and get a little more speed out of her. They really addressed the noise issue. They covered everything in rubber, took whatever steps they needed to take to try and minimize that and did make it quieter. So, so that was done. It's not quiet, but it is quieter than, a, than, a, than it was. And despite all these flaws of being slow and being noisy and being able to be seen a uh, long ways away, in my opinion, she still snuck up on an American carrier group in 2015, got past our latest sonar systems and simulated sinking a American carrier with the American carrier escort vessels. So despite being um, noisy and slow and all of its faults, it's still a carrier killer. Yeah. So maybe this just shows how much of an advantage every submarine has at sea. It's just, it's, it's not even, it's like the varsity team playing the JV team, submarines versus surface ships. We are going to pounce them uh, every time we get engaged with them. And uh, thankfully that wasn't a real fight because we would have lost a carrier and everyone on board. And then finally, uh, because this is nuclear powered, the Rubus has global reach. Matter of fact, right now there is a Rubus operating with the American Navy near the South China Sea. Yep, they're spending a few months over there in the Pacific working with Australia, Indonesia, the Americans, and, the, and, and Japan is taking part in these, in these war games during the month of May. And they're over there with one of their Rubus. Uh, I don't know which one it is, but one of the Rubus is over there right now uh, doing war games. So she's, she's, she's global capable and a carrier killer. And that's really all that needs to happen to get the uh, signature approval, in my opinion, of, of, of how good the submarine is. So she, she has some faults, 
but she'll uh, she'll take down your fleet. And that is the Rubus Amethyst. All right, everybody. So that's it. Thank you for uh, listening to my sub brief. I want to say thank you very much to the department heads this month. We have William Collier, uh, JB, and Adam Morgan. Thank you guys for being department heads. Division officers are Brendan Ferry, DJS 4000, Jordan Vadasraka, Joel Cornett, our newest member of the boardroom. Thank you, Joel, for joining us. Jason Wang, Scott Morgan, Sean O'Neill, the two absolute plank owners of the wardroom still here and Mr. Josh Vornick. Thank you all for supporting the sub brief and, uh, and what we do here. And we will see you with the podcast in a couple of weeks. All right. Look forward to making the, the podcast this month.